So I'd like you to put your sh uh, yourself in the shoes of a net internet service provider. So you own this network, you have a couple of border routers, and more specifically, you provide API Transit services to one customer that phones you and tells you, well, my clients have issues to uh, reach my network. So what do you do? Well, you may want to answer some basic question about your network. So for example, where's the traffic coming from? So where did this packet about to enter my customer network enter my own network? Uh, what path did it follow? So these two questions actually uh, requires you to be able to match observation across several vantage points. So uh, for example, uh, understand that the packet that you saw at router D entered the network at another, at another place. And that's something that's actually not possible to do with uh, in-network data sampling. So operators rely on NetFlow for most of the data, and that's something you can't do. So we checked with a T1 ISP uh, for which we had NetFlow data. We could not observe matching observation across the network. Once you know the path, you may want to be interested into what's the performance of it. So if there are multiple of them, uh, are there load balance probably, or do, we, do you have some form of congestion maybe happening? Uh, you have a set of packets about to enter your network. How long will they take to reach your own customer? Is it acceptable? Is it stable over time? Uh, are there losses? So we had three packets entering the network. How many actually reached the customer network? So these are questions that requires a packet level visibility over specific flow of interest. And there's a, there has been a, a lot of work to get that, mostly for data centers. And the key issue here is that uh, ISP networks have specific constraints. So for example, they don't control the end host. So we can't use them to probe the network, we play traces of stuff like this. Uh, we don't own the actual traffic, so we can't modify the headers that much. We are limited by what the routers support, and the processing power of routers is fairly limited. So we can do complex stuff directly in, in the data plane. And the most, the most, uh, the biggest constraint we have is that we are actually limited as to what monitoring information we can stream over the network. So be it packet monitoring, it, uh, just raw statistic or whatever, we are, li we are heavily limited because we need, the, we need it to coexist with uh, actual customer data. And so we need to figure a way to get raw information about single packets while still limiting our overhead. And so that's what Stroboscope is about. So Stroboscope is our solution to get uh, visibility over individual packets in ISP networks. And so the first, I'll start by introducing uh, the new primitive we are leveraging, which we call traffic slicing. So consider uh, the same network again. You have a set of packets about to enter it. And so packets get forwarded by the ingress router. Nothing different so far. So with Stroboscope, we have this concept of uh, a node mirroring rule. So we have a collector somewhere that will instruct the router, please, if you see any packet towards the 1, the 2, the 3, the 0, slash 24 prefix, please uh, make a copy of it, encapsulate it, and send it, us, send it to us. And so that's what's happened. So router A sees a stream of packet arriving for the blue prefix, duplicate them, and send them for, to our collector for analysis. Now we can do a bit more than just activating mirroring. We can also give it uh, an expiration date if you want. So we can say mirror traffic for this amount of time. And so the router after that particular amount of time can stop mirroring, and so the traffic still froze in the network and we stopped getting the data. And that was what we call a traffic slice. So that, that's a small set of packets that got mirrored by a router somewhere in the network for a specific flow. And we can iterate this process over time. So after a while, I can activate again the mirroring rule, get uh, mirrored packets, get it deactivated, and I've got a second traffic slice, so a second snapshot of what was getting through that, that particular router at various moments in time. So this is not, not just a theoretical construct, so this is widely supported. So most vendors have been supported for decades are traffic mirroring primitives with various names, and Almost all of them also support some encapsulation primitives, so GRE tunnels or something like that, or other techniques. If you think Cisco, that's called uh, Earthspan. I'll let you find the other names for the vendors. Uh, activating mirroring. So this whole process or starting to copy uh, packets is simply updating one access list. So if you see this flow, send it to us, mark it. Uh, 
routers have been providing uh, high-level APIs for a while now that let us, let us set timers for these access list entries. And so they can deactivate them autonomously so we are resilient to control the failures. And finally, that's the key part of, well, actually the main motivation for, the, for this work. Uh, routers are super efficient to do this. So they can switch mirroring on and off for a single flow within 22 milliseconds. So we can really get super short uh, set of packets anywhere we want in the network for any flow we want. And that's quite powerful. So if you get back to our network, we assume that that's the path that will be taken by the traffic, but we are not so sure about. So in our framework, uh, the, the operator has to require, to express requirements in a high level declarative language. So please mirror traffic towards this particular destination prefix along this path, so ABCD. So that's what's written on the left. That's the only input the operator gives us. Gives, uh, server scope then on its behalf, conceptually will place mirroring rules on every single router on the path. And if you do that, well, you get this set of traffic slices. So activated at roughly the same time, more or less, you get sets of packets that were forwarded by every single router. And because we have the actual packets in their payload, we can just match them across and synchronize the traffic slices like this. So we don't need a global clock synchronization just because we use the data itself as a marker. Now let's say that we want to make some high level analysis. Well, for this, we add a second construct in our set of requirements, which we call a confined query. So a confined query, similarly to the mirror one, uh, is uh, a requirement from the operator to get information about any single packet that would be exist exiting a confinement region. So in this case, uh, that's conceptually equal to mirroring on every single highlighted edges. So if we do see any traffic towards our customer network flowing over there, please raise an alarm. That's the whole idea. Now that we have these two queries in parallel, we can actually start to reason about what we saw with the traffic slices. So we had this uh, packet number five that was seen at router A, so at the ingress in the network, that was seen at the second router, so router B, and that all of a sudden disappeared from all traffic slices. Because there, was, there were no alarms being raised uh, from the confinement queries, well, we can actually deduce that it got lost in the network. Similarly, uh, if we check the packet number seven, we've seen it entering the network and we've seen it leaving the network. Due to the shape that the specific confinement region here has, actually the only way uh, it could have been forwarded within that region was through router E. And so this is a hard evidence that there are load balancing happening in this particular network. And so these are the, some analysis that you can do automatically. So you just take the input graphs, you compute a set of properties you're interested in too, and then you apply this set of reasonings. And there, these are just counting problems that I've presented so far. You can be much more creative. So you could try to track uh, the set of ingress and ingress pairs in the, rot, uh, in the network for any given flow at any given time. You could try to reconstruct uh, arrival timestamps. So you could measure when we delays. You could actually take a look at the payload of these packets and do some form of traffic sketching, understanding what's flowing, is it an attack or something. So that's quite powerful. That's the visibility, the visibility we get from single packets. So now the big issue is that I've said we, we are doing traffic mirroring. So how do we make sure that we are not actually breaking our own network? And so we have a whole algorithmic pipeline which I'll introduce here. So I've presented two queries and so we'll look at each one of them separately. So first the mirror query. The mirror query uh, we have as a goal to be able to reconstruct, reconstruct paths taken by packets. So if I have this particular mirror query, so uh, mirror any traffic for the, the destination of interest over a single path, I want to be able to make sure that if I have a packet match between uh, the traffic slice from router A and router B, I need to be able to prove that the packet actually was flowing around uh, along the highlighted edge. And that's fairly easy to do. You have the packet, well, you just look at the TTL decrease. If it's one, then you know it was over that particular edge. If it's higher than that, then it probably went through router E or somewhere else. But that's expensive to do. So say I had, uh, this particle flow was, had a traffic demand of 100 megabits per second, while all of a sudden I'm mirroring 400 megabits per second of mirror traffic. So that's quite expensive. And we could reduce it. So for example, if I remove the mirroring rule at router C, uh, 
I can still, by analyzing uh, packet matching matches across the traffic slides from router B and router D, unambiguously uh, reconstruct the path that was taken because there's a single path of length two from these two nodes. If I, if I want to go one step further and remove the mirroring rule at router B, well, all of a sudden I've created ambiguity in the measurements I'm producing because there are multiple paths of the exact same edge length. And so the, just the TTL criteria is not sufficient anymore. And so this whole process of identify the, identifying the minimum set of mirroring location is what we call the keyboard sampling algorithm. And we have probably correct guarantees that we can always reconstruct the exact path followed by the packet in a non-ambiguous fashion. So let's move on to the confined query. So as I told you, because we want to make sure to catch any packet leaving the confinement region, well, we have to start at the edges. So we want to mirror at every single edge touching the region. The issue is that it's expensive uh, on the control, control plane. So that's a lot of, states, of state to be activating, deactivating, and shuffling around. So if we were able to push this mirroring rule, for example, further down, uh, for example, to the neighboring nodes, or even further away up to the minimal lower um, multi-terminal uh, node cut, this will heavily reduce the pressure we put on the, on the control plane. However, this imposes runtime guarantees to be checked. So for example, here, we need to make sure that there are no traffic loops between router B and X. Otherwise, we would not be able to catch it with just a mirroring rule at router Z. And so for this, we have the surrounding algorithms, which, which picks uh, the level of mirroring of uh, surrounding node cuts that we have to pick depending on the runtime probabilities that you're able to check. That's not enough. So I've been able to minimize the number of mirroring location. If I have a thousand queries, still requiring a couple of megabits of mirror traffic to be activated at the same time, well, that's probably still too high for the budget I have. And so the next step in the algorithmic pipeline is to spread the activation with these queries over time to make sure that we can meet, actually, the uh, monitoring budget. And so our operator express, uh, ex explicitly tells us, while you are allowed to, allowed to use this amount of bandwidth during this amount of time, so 40 megs here during 150 milliseconds. So from this information, we can actually uh, split a schedule in time slots of roughly 30 milliseconds for this example. So that's a blue governed by both the underlying mirroring technology we are using. So in our case, that's, that would be our Cisco routers doing 23 millisecond slices. And the latency you would have in the network to ensure that you have matching uh, matches across slices. Now I have a bunch of queries. I need to pack them into, into this set of time slots. Uh, actually, how do I know how expensive they are? That's not an easy problem, especially given the visibility level you have of the traffic uh, in short amount of time in the network. And so for this, we have a conservative approach. So recall that we do traffic mirroring. So if we were able to mirror a given prefix earlier in time, well, we could just use this information to estimate how expensive it was to estimate the traffic demands towards that prefix. If that's not the case, well, we, we have NetFlow running the networks anyway. So if it happens to be a flow that has enough entries, enough recent entries in the network logs, well, we'll just use the peak observed demons over there. But there are a lot of flows, actually, that we don't see in the network data. And so for this, we have to be super conservative and say that, well, we assume that that's the worst case. These queries will require a complete time slot on their own. And that's the only way to be safe, actually, and to still be able to meet the budget. There's a special case here, which is for the confined queries. So these queries are not expected to mirror any traffic as long as everything's correct. And so we assume them uh, to be uh, costing nothing for scheduling purposes. And so we can push them in every single time slot. To be able to scale to a large number, amount of, to a large number of queries and time slots, we need to split this, actually, this scheduled problem in two parts. So first, uh, we want to estimate a minimal subschedule, so allocating every single query exactly once. So that's a variant of the bin packing problem, and that's NP-hard, so we obviously use a fast approximation heuristics. Once we have this minimal subschedule, well, we can just replicate it to fill as much as possible the monitoring budget we have. But that won't always uh, use everything, and so we have another, another uh, a last optimization that tries to pack as many queries as possible in the budget leftovers. 
So by doing this, we know what we mirror, where we mirror it, for how long, and when we do it. So we actually have deterministic sampling, which is much more powerful if you want to do post-processing analysis afterwards. And that's what allows us to do the, the reasoning I showed earlier on the traffic slices. So can this work in practice? Uh, well, the, the placement algorithms are quite fast. So we, do, we did a benchmarks on every single rocket fuel topologies, as well as most of the topology zoo. So these would be topologies with a couple of hundreds of nodes or up to a couple of thousands of links. And for realistic inputs, so path with uh, about nine to 10 hops, it takes about 10 milliseconds to, do the, to, do the key pod, to run the keypad sampling algorithm, so to select the main location. The surrounding algorithm is much, it's much faster than that and actually does not depend on the size of the input we gave it. It's mostly driven by the layout of the, topolo the topologies themselves. If we look at the scheduling uh, pipeline, well, we mentioned it was a variant of the big packing problem. That's a bit hard. And so getting the optimal solution is super expensive. But we can quickly approximate it. So if we want to support an online or offline use case, we can do that. And finally, uh, the whole point of the system is to be able to limit ourselves, to constrain ourselves to meeting a given target budget. And so we made a small experiment here where we had two routers uh, mirroring traffic from a source to a destination towards a collector, and we, we recorded the, observe, the observed uh, data rates seen both at the collector and then from the source. So earlier uh, at the start, well, it's fine. I mean, we, we sent uh, 1,000 kilobits of traffic. We, more, we mirror twice as much. We meet the budget. Uh, if we start to ramp up the demands, because we work in a discrete fashion, so we have a schedule of time slot, we are able to check before activating any single time slot whether we still have budget left. And if we don't, well, we can stop scheduling. And so that's the reason for the two drops, the two red drops we have. Because we base of our traffic demands from prior measurements, well, uh, the, blue, the blue spike there caused us to, to have a very high estimate for a while. So we actually are super cautious for a while there and activate mirroring during a very low amount of times. And then after a while, you can resume the normal execution once everything is stable again. There's one key peak here, and that's the key information there for this graph, which is that we, can, we have strong guarantees that we never exceed the monitoring budget more than once, uh, during, more than during one time slot in the whole process. So that's 25 milliseconds here, because we won't activate anything else if we exceeded it. So with that said, uh, I'd like to sum up uh, our work in three points. So first, we use uh, a new data plane primitive to do network monitoring, so traffic slicing, so the ability to capture small, small bursts of packet in a deterministic fashion. So we developed a probably correct uh, algorithmic pipeline that gives us strong guarantees on both uh, the accuracy of the measurements we have, so what can we do with them, as well as runtime guarantees us as to how we can actually meet this particular budget. And then because we are actually decoupling uh, measurement analysis from their collection, so we are just getting data out of the network, we are actually quite flexible as to what we want to measure in the end. Uh, we have a small website to introduce the system. The code is also available on GitHub, and we'll be pushing more examples and labs, etc., over the coming weeks. And I'm happy to take questions. Questions? OK, nobody is allowed to leave the room until somebody asks questions. Good. That's a good motivation. Hey, uh, Aaron Gember Jacobson, Colgate University. Uh, so you, uh, how does someone know what's a reasonable budget for them to set, given their goals? Uh, so you have net flow running in the network. You, you have an idea of what's the peak utilization of the network you have as an ISP, so network wide. And so you can use the Slack bandwidth available. What fraction you use, well, that's up to you, whether you want to be super cautious or not. So that's, that's literally network specific and depending on what you expect to see. So I guess, do you have uh, anything that you can do if you in determine that in this allocation, you can't answer all the queries? What do you, how, what's your approach then? 
Like you can't schedule all the queries even once because the budget is not enough for that. So uh, our current approach there is to tell that to the operator that the, the current formulation has no feasible solution. There would be approach you could, for example, try to split prefixes uh, because then you would effectively split the demands. The issue with that is if we do it on the operator behalf, then we hide information and it might not be no longer suitable for the other analysis. So we don't know what what will be the end analysis out of it, so we want to be explicit as to what we provide. So there are ways around it, but we have no automated solution for that. Okay, thanks. Hey, Kwasin uh, from the Politecnica Bucharest. Uh, great work. So um, I have a Stroman solution uh, that, that I think does it cheaper than you, so you have to tell me why I'm wrong. So uh, basically, if I use some sampling on the ingress routers, and then I just capture the fibs of all the routers, then I can basically figure out Roughly where each uh, well where each prefix is entering my network, like uh, and then I can figure out what the route route is. So uh, I could answer some of your queries like that. So why why is this not good enough? Uh, if you have transient events, so the this whole set of question actually came from discussion with the operator, where they had transient behavior and we're not able to understand any of it, because these were super small occurrence. So sometimes connectivity issues. Why we don't know. So how do we Quantify it or how do we evaluate it? So yes, if you if these were frequent enough, enough and large enough, they would, they would be seen in the logs. There's another part of the story here, which is uh, this slide, if it shows, which is due to the scale of the network. Actually, the data they can get out of it is super limited. So this shows you uh, the coverage they have in the network from every single NetFlow log in the network over the, over 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so you see that for prefixes that had one entry, so 71% uh, uh, of the whole PGP space, actually very few of them have, have more, uh, more entries than this. Mm -hmm. So getting any insight as to what were these flows doing or what, what were the flows that were not shown here doing at that particular moment is super hard on their scale. And yeah, you could manually log in on every single router and tap into the traffic, but that's more or less what we do in an automated fashion and okay. controlled fashion. Thanks. No more questions? Okay, so I have one question for you. Uh, have you thought about uh, the expressivity of a stroboscope? Uh, uh, what kind of problems are you able to solve? What kind of problems uh, can, um, can avoid the eyes of a stroboscope? So, uh, the first problem we're trying to solve is getting data out of the network, and so getting these traffic samples, because once you have them, then you can do, well, all the analysis that has been done in data centers in the past, knowing that this only covers a short amount of time at a precise moment. So if it's estimating path properties, so tracking packet as it travels the network, that's something we can easily answer directly here. And so, we provide a super minimal language over there just to say where you want the data, what kind of data you want to get out of it. But the analysis you can do on top of it is quite powerful. For example, the confined queries are presented here in the context of uh, bonding the observation domain. But you could just put confined queries to, well, check that the network is behaving properly. So check that traffic between Swiss banks stays in Switzerland, for example, by just surrounding Switzerland with rules. That should never cost anything unless there's something wrong, and then you would know it. All right. Uh, <coughs> I'm here all time from University Polytechnic of Bucharest. So you're using this to troubleshoot all kinds of weird net network issues. What if the mirror traffic is also affected by the weird network issues? Yeah, so that's, that's the main issue we face indeed. We don't have out-of-band networks, so we have to make this mirror traffic coexist with the actual traffic in the network. And so the only answer to that is, to that is well, hopefully the problem will present itself often enough that by mirroring, repeating this whole schedule multiple times in a row with, well, as, as time goes on, we will see the problem and we'll stop actually draw, losing the measurements we do. But right. that's something for which we have no answer. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you, everybody, for coming to the session.